That shocking video is from a home invasion in Idaho. The man seen breaking into the apartment with a machete was sentenced last week to 15 years in jail after breaking down the door to the home. Dwayne Thomas was shot by the man who lived inside. The homeowner was fortunate. He had a gun or he might have been killed. What would have happened if this took place in Canada? Well, we kind of already know because of Mike Woodard. He's the New Brunswick man whose story we brought you last week. He was attacked with a tire iron inside his own home, struck in the head once. As he was down on the ground, he shot the person that was trying to strike him in the head again. Here's what he told us last week. I think I would have got killed. I'm pretty sure because I almost got killed with a big, I have many, many stitches in my head and um, I almost got killed. And uh, I'm pretty sure if I hadn't, a bit, uh, hadn't had a gun and um, I would have got killed. All right, that's Woodard talking about uh, his thoughts. Now, he is facing charges more serious than those that, uh, that were found to have broken into his home, or alleged. John Lott is a gun rights activist and scholar. He joins us now from Philadelphia. John, you've been studying this a long time. We've talked about your, uh, your seminal work on this before, your book, More Guns, Less Crime. Mr. Woodard is a man who, by all, by all rights, including updated Canadian law, is someone who defended himself are you more likely to be a victim of crime if you've got a gun in your home to defend yourself? Or are you going to be able to fight off criminals like we've just seen in these two cases? You're clearly more likely to be able to defend yourself. There's many types of evidence here. I mean, I'll just give you one example. You look at the National Crime Victimization Survey in the United States. They survey about 150,000 people a year, and they've been doing this survey for over 30 years. And what they have is detailed data. When you're a victim of a crime, how did you respond? What was the crime? What was the final outcome? And what they find is that by far the safest course of action for someone to take when they're confronted by a criminal is to have a gun. It's particularly true for people who are relatively weaker physically, women and the elderly. Right. And Mr. Uh, Woodard, you know, obviously for example, elderly. He's 68. Right, He's being exactly. confronted, confronted by three young punks. They're going to have the advantage on them. Exactly. No, I mean, well, you have three guys attack him. At least one's 19 years of age. Uh, you know, they have multiple advantages on him. Obviously, they'd already struck him successfully once, uh, giving the guy stitches. And, uh, you know, at that point, you have to ask yourself, what reasonable person would you expect him to do at that point? And, you know, when you're in the dark, it's around midnight at night, I can see no other option. Look, the National Crime Victimization Survey breaks it down by 10 different types of responses. You know, do you use your fist? Do you try to run away? Do you use a baseball bat, a mace, a knife, a stun gun, or a gun? And again, out of all the different things that they have, they find consistently across all the different types of crimes that having a gun is by far the safest, the one that's most likely to leave you safe after the crime occurs. Now, we know that what, you know, police forces, it's not just here in Canada. There's plenty of police forces, plenty of legislators, prosecutors don't like citizens responding on their own. It happens in the United States as well, despite the Second Amendment. Uh, what is it that drives the gun grabbers in your experience to say, you know what, let's charge this guy because you shouldn't have pointed a gun at somebody that was trying to kill you. What drives them? Is it just purely ideology that says civilians shouldn't be armed? Uh, maybe partly it's the fact that when they watch the news, they constantly hear about only bad things that happen. They don't hear about uh, successful defensive gun use stories like this. But, you know, in the United States, they happen very frequently. I mean, I, in the last couple of weeks, I can give you dramatic cases where a pastor saved uh, the people of his church when there was an attack. He fortunately had a concealed carry permit. If he hadn't saved people, if people had been killed, I'm sure it would have gotten worldwide attention. There's multiple cr other crimes that are dramatic uh, that happen every day in the United States where citizens save other lives. And, but look, Michael Woodard, the fact that he was able to go and protect himself, there may be some other criminals now who think twice, knowing that there may be other Canadians, you know, particularly if he doesn't end up getting locked up in jail as a result of using a gun defensively. But if, if Canadian criminals begin to understand 
that people can defend themselves and will, that protects other people. Michael Woodard lived in a place where apparently police response time is 40 minutes away. Mm -hmm. Even if he had been able to go and successfully call the police, there's a huge amount of damage that can happen in that time. Even when you're dealing in urban areas where police response times, good response times could be eight minutes or so, that can be the difference between life and death for an individual. Well, as uh, you like to say, when you know, there's uh, one seconds other point count, that, uh, police are minutes away. Right. You know, but the fact that you have somebody out like there, like a Michael Woodard, will hopefully save other lives because criminals will think twice before they attack. You know, Canada has a robbery rate, uh, according to the International Crime Victimization Survey, that's about twice the robbery rate in the United States. And you have to ask the question is, what should people do when they're having to confront a criminal by themselves and simply telling them to behave passively is a recipe for disaster and, and danger for the victim. I know that uh, Michael uh, Woodard is in New Brunswick. I believe the last time I checked the, uh, the crime rate, the homicide rate, um, and everyone thinks, you know, associates guns with homicides for some reason. Homicide rate was higher in the Atlantic provinces than it was in nearby New Hampshire uh, and Vermont, which have some of the freest gun laws in the United States and high gun ownership and uh, significantly lower uh, murder rates. Look, the difference between the United States and Canada in terms of murder rates is pretty much our drug gang crime. We have about 3% of the counties in the United States account for almost 75% of the murders. And if you go and look at maps of those areas, it's very heavily concentrated in little tiny areas even within those urban areas. You, know, you look across the United States, the places that have, have had the biggest increases in gun ownership have had seen the biggest drops in murder rates and violent crime. All right, John, thanks for joining us. It's always great talking to you because you bring facts as opposed to just conjecture. Thanks so much. Share your thoughts on this story, facebook.com slash Brian Lilly.